This is Shelbyville, Springfield's neighbor and rival. Right from its founding, Shelbyville has battled it out with Springfield over its lemon trees, softball championships, and in the yearly pigskin classic. In actuality, Shelbyville is quite similar to its neighbor, with specialized shopping districts, malls, a nuclear power plant, TV shows, and theater district. Despite these similarities, the people of Shelbyville look down their noses at their neighbors, fueling the rivalry even further. Also, Shelbyville may be one of the most inbred cities in America. Yeah. This is the history of Shelbyville. Oh man, why are we looking into Shelbyville today? This is going to be one of those weird ones. I apologize in advance. Today, we're talking about an entire setting, not just an individual character. What's more, it's a setting that our main characters rarely spend time in. The Simpson family definitely visits every once in a while, but we tend to hear about Shelbyville secondhand, typically from that biased Springfield point of view. So what's really the truth about Shelbyville? Is it exactly like Springfield? Is it just their boring neighbor used as a point of comparison? Or does Shelbyville contain a sinister secret? Let's go back to the beginning to find out. Shelbyville made its debut in Season 2's Dancing Homer, when the Springfield Isotopes played the Shelbyville Shelby Villains. The Isotopes are a pretty bad team, but thanks to Homer's smooth moves, they're able to pull off the upset. Technically, this isn't the first appearance of Shelbyville, as we haven't actually been there yet, but we're introduced to them as a general rival. In the flashback episode, The Way We Was, Marge's forensics team has the big upcoming city finals against Shelbyville. That's why she ends up blowing up at Homer. We also get to visit Shelbyville for the first time, with a brief trip to their high school. Love this Splatter Springfield sign, that is some school spirit. We visit a second time in Season 2 in Oh Brother Where Art Thou, when Homer goes to the Shelbyville orphanage to find his half-brother. He eventually finds it. This is the first instance of Shelbyville being portrayed as the sort of mirror world of Springfield, with suspiciously similar characters living in both. These early years liked emphasizing that these two cities are essentially variations on the same thing. Season 3 doubled down on this angle, giving us notable examples in Homer Defined, Homer at the Bat, and Black Widower. It's the introduction of Aristotle Amidopoulos, Shelbyville's Mr. Burns analog and owner of their nuclear power plant. Like Mr. Burns, he thinks his workers are terrible and lazy and has Homer deliver a speech. Also like Mr. Burns, his plant is prone to meltdowns. In Homer at the Bat, he makes a million dollar bet, which kicks off Mr. Burns' hilarious scheme. Interestingly, and I can't believe I've never noticed this before on my many viewings, but there was some confusion in these early days of whether Shelbyville is totally separate from Springfield. The power plant is playing Shelbyville for the city championship. It's right on the banner. All of the other teams they play are part of Springfield. And in the way we was in season two, they describe that as the city forensics finals, implying that Shelbyville is part of Springfield in some way. It's definitely possible they mean it's a city championship in a regional sense, that Springfield and Shelbyville are so close in the same metro area that they combine leagues. It was just weird suddenly noticing how Shelbyville Power Plant is the only out-of-town team that they play. Anyway, we get Shelbyville one last time in Black Widower, when Selma and Cy Joe Bob take their honeymoon there. Interestingly, Chief Wiggum crosses city lines to arrest Bob and blow up their hotel rooms. Other than that, Season 3 is mostly just random references to various unknown locations. We know there's a Shelbyville Downs, someone calls in from Shelbyville Heights, we see the Shelbyville players behind Marge, and thanks to Spinal Tap, we know that Shelbyville is located on Route 401, and that they don't rock as hard as Springfield. Season 4 puts Shelbyville on the back burner, just more random references. We get Lyle Landley taunting Springfield about it being more of a Shelbyville idea. Barney donates $50,000 to their dance theater. Grandpa regales us with a story about taking the ferry to Shelbyville, which was called Morganville in those days. According to Marge and Chains, Shelbyville is 47 miles away. The only time that we go there is in the finale, when Bart visits Hugh Hefner in his Shelbyville mansion. I think it's fair to say that the David Merkin era, seasons 5 and 6, was the peak of the mountain for Shelbyville on The Simpsons. 
and it's easy to guess why. First, we have Homer Loves Flanders, which introduces the big pigskin classic. This episode establishes the bitter and petty rivalry between the two cities beyond sporting events. According to Lisa, they built a mini mall, so we built a bigger mini mall. They made the world's largest pizza, so we burnt down their city hall. But Shelbyville ended up getting the last lap. I always forget with all these Springfield characters that all these scenes at the big game actually take place at Shelbyville Stadium. I mean, come on, a Springfield ticket booth wouldn't be this stupid, right? Anyway, it's worth noting that once again, Shelbyville ends up losing the big game against Springfield. Homer seems to be their kryptonite. In Season 6, we get Lemon of Troy, the biggest exploration of Shelbyville in series history. We learn about the founding of the two cities, the expedition of Jebediah Springfield and Shelbyville Manhattan. The retelling is kind of funny, given what we know about goody goody Jebediah from Lisa the Iconoclast. He doth protest too much, methinks. Meanwhile, Shelbyville Manhattan just wants to marry his attractive cousin. Here's where they really lean into the concept of Shelbyville as the bizarro Springfield, with this Homer and Bart looking family, they even have their own millhouse. They have the Speedy Mart instead of the Quickie Mart, Joe's instead of Moe's. Their elementary school looks exactly the same, except with a female Scottish groundskeeper. The adults drink Fud beer instead of Duff, similar to Spittle County. Also, their fire hydrants are yellow, oh my gosh. Obviously, this episode is great at portraying the pointless and arbitrary rivalries between the two cities. Shelbyville doesn't give a crap about the missing kids, would rather call them if they turn up in the morgue. The kids are eager to steal Springfield's lemon tree. I like how, even though the rivalry is arbitrary, we the audience root for our dudes in Springfield anyway, and laugh at them for being stuck with their turnip juice. Like, Springfield sucks, but they do a great job making these guys unsympathetic. At least Shelbyville is the birthplace of lemon posting, which is one of the best kinds of posting. It's interesting though, we do get some mixed signals elsewhere in the Merkin era that implies that Shelbyville may be better off than Springfield, at least when it comes to their field trips. They get to go to the slide factory instead of the box factory, and Principal Valiant is making sure his students get a little extra education at Fort Springfield. I guess Shelbyville must have passed the tax levy for their schools. This is an Ohio joke, by the way. Anyway, after Lemon of Troy, Shelbyville goes out of focus for quite some time. The show had sort of built up the big Shelbyville adventure, and once you've done it, you don't necessarily need to go back to that well again. What are they gonna do, a Lemon Tree sequel episode? Come on. During the Oakley and Weinstein years, the only stuff we hear about is how the giant sunblocker is dropped on them, how Officer Lou went to a McDonald's in Shelbyville, Homer thinks this desert is Shelbyville, and during Prohibition, booze was being run from there. This is pretty much the new reality for Shelbyville on the show for a while. There's not much of a chronology at this point to Shelbyville development. It's established, it exists. It's a few random references here or there, and occasionally affecting the plot in some way. For example, there are plenty of later episodes that feature characters that came from Shelbyville, like the church's new associate pastor. Bart's new teacher came from Shelbyville Prep, after being fired for duct taping kids to the wall. In season 19's The Debarded, Donnie is secretly from Shelbyville Orphanage. We even get to see what the orphanage looks like. Boy, Dr. Hibbert's brother sure did let this place go to hell. In season 32's Uncut Femmes, we discover that Sarah Wiggum used to be a thief in Shelbyville. She actually met Clancy during one of her heists. Her job was to distract the security guard, but became so enamored with him that she ruined the getaway. Oh, and you remember Nelson's two weasels from the early years? The ones from Bart the General and Saturdays of Thunder? It turns out, they moved to Shelbyville Elementary. That's where they went. There are a few more examples where Shelbyville is tangentially plot-related, like in Trilogy of Error when Homer asks Cletus to drive him to Shelbyville Hospital and then is forced to walk. But it's extremely rare for an episode to spend an extended amount of time in Shelbyville itself. By my count, it's really just four episodes in the past 25 years. Season 16's The Seven Beer Snitch opens with the family visiting Shelbyville Merchandise Mile and enjoying its many upscale stores. They stop by the famous Shelbyville Theater District and see the show Song of Shelbyville. 
The show opens with an upbeat number proudly celebrating the city and being the birthplace of the button fly. And afterward, they repeatedly dunk on Springfield Billy, their poor backward neighbor that ain't so smart. Lisa, furious about this characterization, tries to argue with them, but ends up getting hooted down by the crowd. Hoot, hoot, hoot! This episode is somewhat unusual in how it portrays Shelbyville as being of a higher class than Springfield, almost like a Pawnee vs. Eagleton vibe from Parks and Rec. This might just be the fact that the Simpsons are in the ritzy area of town. Maybe Fancy Springfield thinks that Shelbyville are a bunch of hicks. Still, aside from a few references here or there, the show instead emphasizes how both cities are on the same level. In season 17's Regarding Margie, Marge suffers a bout of amnesia and questions her marriage to Homer. So Patty and Selma take Marge to a speed dating event in Shelbyville. We learn their city motto and that Shelbyville has just a terrible dating pool as Springfield. Marge does meet this guy, who seems pretty nice at first. And naturally, as the bizarro Springfield, this guy has two husky voiced twin brothers. Marge returns to Shelbyville in season 30 during her stint selling healing crystals. A Shelbyville owner of a competing business stops by Marge's garage to threaten her. So Marge starts a turf war in Shelbyville Mall, bringing her Springfieldian friends along to sabotage her. And finally, we need to talk about season 24's Adventures in Baby Getting. Oh boy, here we go. So in this one, Marge wants to have another baby, but unfortunately, due to his job, Homer is shooting blanks. But they're in luck. When Homer was younger, he used to sell his sperm at the Shelbyville Fertility Clinic, and they're able to procure his last sample on file. Also, wow, how long ago did this happen? Homer only weighed 190 pounds at the time, and his blood type has changed since season two. But whatever, we have bigger problems. Shelbyville was offering $50 per sample, and Homer used this method to buy a Corvette. So he donated a lot of sperm. Like, a lot of it. We find out, via this photo wall, that Homer has biologically fathered many, many, many children. There are probably hundreds of Homer's kids running around Shelbyville. Now, to be fair, not all of Homer's offspring might be living there. People could come from all over to the sperm bank. I mean, Homer went to theirs to donate instead of the one in town. They built a sperm bank, so Springfield built a bigger one. Still, I would imagine that a lot of those families were from Shelbyville. And for a town that is already into marrying their own cousins, well, I am very concerned about the Shelbyville gene pool. Too many cousins, too many Homer half-siblings. This is already a town full of Springfield doppelgangers roaming around. Like, Luann Van Houten is from Shelbyville and supposedly married her Springfield counterpart. Starting to wonder if time travel is involved somehow with the look of this guy. I realize that I'm biased because our favorite characters are from Springfield, but, uh, is there something wrong with Shelbyville? Is this one of those places where the less you know, the better off you are? Well, too bad, because we've got a whole laundry list of random ass Shelbyville references and factoids we still gotta get through. I promise you, none of them will have the implications as that last one. Let's instead break down various random topics about the city. You know, lighthearted stuff like the Shelbyville sinkhole disaster that they're praying for, as well as that nuclear bomb that was detonated in their city. Hmm. Well, at least they got to host the Olympics that one time after Springfield blew it. Speaking of which, Shelbyville continued its rivalry in the sports arena, with the Shelbyville starter stashes being defeated by Lisa's Moneyball Strats. Springfield's girls basketball team managed to beat Shelbyville 2 to nothing in triple overtime. However, Shelbyville's team did defeat Springfield in the Little League Championship, thanks to Bart's choke job. In a rare act of goodwill between cities, they were actually gracious enough to give him 78 more tries afterward to save face. Even Shelbyville hated being a part of this episode. We learn about Shelbyville's entertainment industry over the years. They have their own talk radio programs, and they're the filming location of Springfield Squares for some reason, and they have their own reality show, The Housewives of Shelbyville. Skinner and Edna plan on having their romantic honeymoon at Lake Shelbyville, because nothing says a doomed marriage more than a Shelbyville honeymoon. In the book job, that sneaky Neil Gaiman runs off to Shelbyville Beach in the end. 
In the news, we hear about the non-uplets born in Shelbyville Hospital, which are way better than octuplets. Also, the famous two-headed goat was born in Shelbyville, although it went to Springfield to die. Actually, animals are another consistent theme when it comes to Shelbyville. I mean, we saw their zoo and Lemon of Troy, but we also know they have a bird sanctuary. There is a Springfield to Shelbyville pigeon race. Springfield rents a very expensive crane from Shelbyville. And Lisa suggests taking an eagle they caught to Shelbyville Animal Rescue. Huh. Actually, it's all just bird stuff. I bet Diggs ended up running off to Shelbyville too. Finally, to close out this grab bag, we have the Shelbyville businesses and organizations. Comic Book Guy worries that if he closes his store, he'll lose all of his business to Frodo's of Shelbyville. They built a youth center in Season 17 that Snake suggests volunteering at. Homer gets his dry cleaning done there because he doesn't want Springfield to know his size. The Simpsons also gets their beanbag chairs repaired in Shelbyville. They visit Pest Buy in Season 20 to buy candy-colored poison. Now, do any of these places necessarily have to exist in Shelbyville for the purpose of the plot? Absolutely not. But it does provide some needed texture to the world, making Springfield not feel like it's isolated in a dome or something. Oh yeah, that reminds me. Tom Hanks says that this giant canyon is east of Shelbyville. Doing all this research, I was surprised how little we actually got to see Shelbyville after Lemon of Troy. That Song of Shelbyville sequence was easily the biggest showpiece for the city in the later years. The Simpsons didn't seem especially interested in exploring the city much further. Like when they did that immigration allegory in Season 20, it's about the people of Ogdenville, not Shelbyville. For a city fond of doing sequel episodes over the past 20 years, it's somewhat surprising that they never did a second Grand Shelbyville adventure. Even still, I don't think the actual world of Shelbyville matters that much in the context of The Simpsons. It's nice to know the specific details now, but it's not really the point. The show has done a nice job of portraying the stupid tribalistic nature that people have. That two neighboring places will inevitably start an arbitrary rivalry and try to make themselves feel superior. I think everyone, no matter where you live, has experienced that to some degree, from high school to entire states. Like, Michigan and Ohio are always going at it, Virginia and West Virginia, Oklahoma and Texas, Montana and Idaho. I don't know what's going on up there. The point is, in the world of The Simpsons, we tend to see things from Springfield's biased point of view. We cluck our tongues, saying, of course Shelbyville is gross and terrible. They're all marrying their cousins over there. We don't really need to know specifically how messed up Shelbyville's gene pool is. The legends and the gossip are the most important. They need to exist as general boogeymen to keep the characters on their toes, and Shelbyville definitely accomplishes that. Springfield sucks, but in my heart of hearts, I just know that Shelbyville sucks even more. Let me know in the comments what you think of Shelbyville on The Simpsons. Is this a place you wish we got to see more? Would it even be possible to do a good sequel to Lemon of Troy? I kind of like how mysterious it remains after all these years. Shelbyville is so boring and commonplace, yet there's something uncanny about it that weirds me out. Also, let me know who you would like to see for the next Simpsons history. There is currently a lot of momentum behind the Springfield Elementary cast. The three bullies, Groundskeeper Willie, Janie, even Uter. I don't even know if that one is possible. I do take your nominations into consideration, so let your voice be heard. Just no more cities for a while. As always, thanks for watching.